Good morning. morning. It's a good day, huh? You guys look beautiful. Thanks for coming here. You know, we never take it for granted. I know I speak for the folks here at Unity on the staff. We never take it for granted that you choose to spend your morning here uh, at Unity. You could be anywhere else. And I personally never take it for granted that anybody ever comes back after they hear me speak, Um, especially after the last Sunday I was here. So... um, (laughs) <laughs> so thank you for coming back. <laughs> I have a message this morning from one of Jesus' parables in the New Testament, and it's a parable that I've come back to from time to time in the last year or so, and I kept thinking that I would share it here uh, on a Sunday in the message here, um, but I, you know, I couldn't quite settle on what the message was. I, I just couldn't quite get it. So. Um, when I got asked to be here this morning, I said, you know what, I'm going to do this parable. I need to get to the bottom of this one. So I'm going to just share with you uh, what I have from this passage. And as always, I just invite you to see what's in it for you. I'm just simply sharing my own perspective and my own understanding of, of the material and how it's impacted me and how it affects my life. And so I just do that in the hope that you'll be able to, in my sharing, find something that works for you. I certainly don't claim to have the capital T truth about really anything. So um, I just invite you to open your hearts and your spiritual ears and hear whatever is there for you to hear today that fits your life so that you can apply it for your benefit. So this parable is a famous one, and um, it's recorded in Luke's gospel in a section where Jesus is dealing with religious elites. It's a particular school of thought in the Judaism of his day, a a group of uh, scholars known as Pharisees, and they were criticizing him for the people, mainly for the people he hung out with. Um, Prostitutes, tax collectors, the sort of first century equivalent of loan sharks. Um, and other such problematic uh, people. And Jesus tells a few stories in order to answer these criticisms. Uh, The first one is a story about a shepherd who has 100 sheep, but he's lost one, so he leaves the 99, and then he goes out, and he finds the one. The second story is about a woman who has a, a bag of coins, and she loses one coin, and she scours her house up and down until she finds that one coin, and then uh, there's great gladness about that. And then he tells this third story which is about a father and his two sons. And the parable is very famous. It's famously called the parable of the prodigal son. So perhaps you know this story or you've heard of it. So let's read it. This is in Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 11. And Jesus continued speaking. There was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. He was so hungry, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, the servant replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. 
But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The end. So it's a good story. It's very memorable. Story, nice story, celebrates reunion, restoration, family, lots of good things, and it gives us a happy ending. And taken in the context of the other stories that come before it in that chapter about the lost sheep and the lost coin, this one is obviously about the lost son. And in all three stories, what is lost is found, and there's great rejoicing. Now, traditionally, these stories are interpreted theologically within Christianity to speak of God's saving grace and love to those of us who, using the traditional theological language, are in sin, are sinful. We've lost, we're lost in sin and have turned our backs on God and walked away to live these wayward lives uh, out of touch with the ways of God. And so the story is about God's love and grace and forgiveness um, that, is, that he or she, God, freely offers to those who repent and return. You know, this is perfectly fine. Uh, for many people in traditional Christianity, this is a very meaningful message. And for those of us here this morning, who, this may also be a very traditional but meaningful message, even despite the sort of sin language that some of us here in the unity community don't really use. We kind of cringe at it a little bit, or we've moved past it. We've moved to another type of language and thinking about God in our own journeys. I think this story invites us to see ourselves in it, in the characters of the story. And the traditional message here of God's love and grace is meaningful to us. It can be meaningful to us, particularly if we see ourselves as the younger son, if we see ourselves in him. As the younger son, the story tells us that God cares for us like a good Father, God's love is steadfast, God's grace and mercy, as the scripture tells us, is new every morning. No matter what mistakes we've made or what foolish choices we've indulged or how long we've been estranged from the things of God, none of that matters. We can always come back. God is waiting on us, willing to receive us and to celebrate us and to help us begin our lives newly. You know, this is a powerful thing. And if you're here this morning and you see yourself in that younger son, and I invite you to seize that, seize that part of this story and of this message and use it for yourself and to find a way back. A way back from what, you might ask? Well, I don't know. Whatever it is or wherever it is that you've been or whatever it is you've been doing that has you be lost. It's easy to get lost. Lots of us are lost or have been lost and will be lost. We can get lost in our work. We can get lost in the ways this young son got lost, just living a life of frivolous pursuits of food and sex and partying. We can live a life lost in the busyness of life, the endless to-do lists that never get any shorter no matter how much we're running around with our hair on fire. We can just lose ourselves completely in all that. Not, you know, you wake up and 20 years have passed. Lost in today's consumer culture that just barrages us all the time with messages that we're horrible if we don't buy this thing or do this thing that costs too much money and really doesn't have any inherent worth. Lost in addiction, all kinds of addictions. Lost in our own demons. There's all kinds of ways to be lost. So if, if you're here this morning and you've been lost in some way for any length of time, I invite you to take the fact that you're sitting here this morning at Unity Church when you could be anywhere else, take this, that fact as a first step back toward being found, 
to the God or spirit or whatever you want to call it, sees you as a precious son and a precious daughter and wants you back, is waiting for you. You don't have to stay lost. None of us do. We can come back. We can come home to the things of God. We can come home to our truer, more authentic selves. Come home to a kind of healing and wholeness and completion within ourselves that maybe we have not had up to this point. So spirit is eager to receive you. So if that's you, seize that for yourself. The younger son, of course, is not the only character in the story. There's also his older brother. He's not the prodigal son like his little brother, the son who spent extravagantly and wasted all his inheritance and all his money. The older son, he's the good son. The good son. He's the responsible son. You know this person. <laughs> Some of you are this person. The one who never got in trouble. Left home only to go to college. Yeah. <laughs> Made good grades, graduated with honors, came home to run the family business. <laughs> always been dependable, made the parents proud, made the family proud, has always done the right and the prudent thing. And so he's resentful when his screw-up of a brother comes home and his dad makes a big deal about it. I've worked like a slave for you my whole life and you never even killed a little goat so that I could have a reception with my friends and my for me and look what you did for this son of yours notice he says that he isn't for my brother he goes this son of yours <laughs> he's bitter the older brother is an accountant And I don't mean that he's the literal accountant of his father's business, although it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case in some variant you know, version of the story in some lost gospel. I mean that the older brother keeps track of things. He keeps track of what he does and what, what he doesn't do, what others do and what they don't do. He keeps track of his own virtue and his vices, and he keeps track of other people's virtues and their vices. He makes sure that things balance out, that he gets what he deserves and that other people get what they deserve. He's very clear about what he's earned in life and what others have or have not earned. He's got it all on a spreadsheet <laughs> in his mind. And he keeps track of it all the time with everyone in his life. <laughs> Do you recognize him? Maybe you see a little bit of yourself in him sometimes. I do. Some of us, whether or not we were the so-called good kid growing up, some of us are really good at keeping spreadsheets, at keeping score. We know who's winning and who's losing. We know who deserves the blessings that they have and those who don't deserve them. We've kept track of it and we enforce it, making sure we don't give to those who don't deserve it, making sure we don't waste our own resources on people who haven't or won't surely earn it. And we provide this accounting service for everyone. <laughs> for everybody in Houston, everybody in America, everybody in Europe, everybody at work, especially those workers. <laughs> our friends, our family, even our spouses and our kids. And we do it in big ways and we do it in small ways. You know, I catch myself doing this with Nishta sometimes, my partner of 13 years. I do this in very small, everyday, sneaky ways. For example, you know, we'll go for a week or so. And I, she doesn't do, maybe, what I deem to be her part of things. 
You know, housework, yard work, you know, the stuff. And she doesn't do what I think is her share. So then I'll run the numbers and then I need to decide if I'm gonna kind of just pull back and not do my part, you know, just to keep it level. I'm gonna give myself a little bit more so that I have a little bit of an edge, you know, a little bit of an advantage. My score's a little bit better than hers. You know, I gotta keep it to my advantage. This is so silly and small, isn't it? And I'm being so small when I do that. But this is, these are the kind of everyday things that we can get trapped into when we're doing spreadsheet thinking. You know, I caught myself in this type of scorekeeping, accounting way of thinking in a very serious way several years ago in my family. And I wanna share it with you because it was the first time in my life in which I was really confronted really confronted with this way of thinking and the kind of damage that it can do in life. My parents had retired and had spent the first four years of their retirement caring for my mother's mother, my grandmother. My mother's younger sister was supposed to have taken on the duty of caring for their mother. That was the agreement, but she didn't do it. She took the inheritance that her mother had given her in exchange for a promise of care. She cared for her for a little while, but then she quite literally abandoned her and physically left my grandmother in the driveway with her, in my parents' driveway with her suitcase and drove off. So I added up the tally on my spreadsheet <laughs> and decided in that moment that my aunt's column on the spreadsheet was very deficient. And so four years later, my grandmother died. And at about that same time, my aunt who'd abandoned my grandmother was diagnosed with a deadly and debilitating disease. And her own daughters were not willing to care for her. She had alienated them. She had alienated her ex-husbands there were several of them, and her current male companion. So she showed up sick and dying in my parents' driveway, asking if she could live with them and if my mother, a retired registered nurse, would care for her. So my parents called me, I had, was living here in Houston at that time, and told me about it, and you can imagine <laughs> what my response was, being that at that time, I was a master spreadsheet keeper. <laughs> I responded that when they asked me what I thought, I said, well, she's made her bed, <laughs> and you all need to just let her lie in it. She'd abandoned her mother, in some ways, she had abandoned her children when they were young. She deserved to be abandoned. It was sad and tragic, but she was reaping what she had sown. She was getting, you know, what goes around comes around. My parents, I told them, I said, they, they, they didn't know her a thing. And in fact, she would go to her grave in their debt, even if they didn't ever lift a finger to care for her. End of discussion. I had the spreadsheet, and that's what it showed. My heart was very hard, doesn't even capture it. So my parents were very generous with me. They told me they understood my feelings and my position in the matter, and they were very patient and thoughtful as they listened to me. But in the end, they received my mother's sister into their home and they cared for her for a number of years. And my, my parents told me, uh, they said, look, that as people of faith, they just could not turn their back on their sister, no matter whatever she had done to them or to anyone else or even to herself. She was their sister and they loved her and they had the will and the means to care for her, so they did. And she made a miraculous, literally miraculous recovery. And she and my parents, I watched it. They became closer than I had ever seen them be 
in my entire lifetime, and she restored her relationship with the best of her husbands. And uh, they together lived out, and her children, and they together lived out the rest of her life for another decade or more. And it was a good, good decade for them. And it, it literally was a miracle in our family. And it was a miracle because of my parents' generosity and radical love. And it pushed me, as I saw it happen, to see the limits, the, the real limits, of being a spiritual accountant. You know, I cared about what she deserved, but my parents, they cared about what she needed. I cared about what my parents deserved because they were people who had gone far beyond duty, but they cared about what they could give and how they could help. I cared about being right. They cared about having a relationship. Those are two very different things. If my parents had been spiritual scorekeepers like me at that time, I don't think any of the good that came in the last decade of my aunt's life would have happened. In fact, I don't think she would have even lived long enough for it to happen. I don't think she would have received, she wouldn't have received the grace and the love that, they got, that she got from them in a way that healed her. It literally healed her and brought wholeness to her soul. So much so that she was finally able to be the sister and the mother and the wife that last decade of her life that she had never managed to be able to be up to that point in her life. She finally got it right, so-called, because she was loved unconditionally by people who didn't care that she never got it right and didn't care if she ever would. That wasn't even part of their calculus. So this brings us to the third character in the story, the father. In my family story, my parents play that role, opening their arms to their wayward sister in a time of her desperate need, regardless of her past actions. The father in this story is an extraordinary figure, I think, because he exhibits an unbelievable capacity for love and abundance that I personally find breathtaking. He t the story even tells us, if you, if you heard it right, that, that before the son even gets there and, and says what he's planned to say to his father and repents and all that, before that even happens, the father sees his son from a distance on the horizon and just breaks into a run for him and just embraces him and, and gives him everything and welcomes him back before he even heard any of it. It doesn't matter what the son was gonna say. It doesn't matter if he was gonna live up to it. It doesn't matter, nothing matters. He's back, Let's, I wanna receive him, he's back. That's all that matters. Simply glad to have him back. I think a lot of us who are parents can relate to this. We see this father in this story and can relate to it. I've only been a parent for not quite three years, but I feel the grip of terror that seizes my heart when my son's out of my sight for a few seconds on the playground or in the grocery store as a toddler. It's terrifying. I think of parents, some of you, parents, your sons and daughters are serving in the armed forces. You don't know if they're alive or dead any given time. Maybe you don't hear from them from a long time. Think of the, the parents of journalists lost in Syria, the, those poor Nigerian parents of those girls. I mean, so many different situations where parents go for years and months and years not knowing. I can't imagine the father in this story. I don't know how people manage their lives in such a situation. So as a parent, I can see, uh, and maybe you if you're a parent, you can see this father. And you can see yourself having a similar reaction you know, the, the long lost son or daughter shows up on the horizon and there's only one thing to do, just go and tackle them. <laughs> just tackle them with love and tears and hugs and kisses. I mean, they're back, it doesn't matter, they're back. And that's what matters. But I think there's a deeper message here and it has to do with the meaning of this word prodigal. This parable is always called the parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal means to spend extravagantly and even wastefully or at least indiscriminately. The son is usually the one seen here as having been prodigal in the handling of his 
inheritance that he got from his father. There's a Lutheran minister, though, in Denver. She has a church there. Her name's Nadia Bowles Weber, and I really like her. I follow her work, and she has suggested something uh, about this parable that I think she's right about, and it's this, that the term prodigal applies as much or even more to the father in this passage as it does to the son, to the younger son. Yes, it was the younger son who spends all his father's money and wastes it all, but it's the father who extravagantly extends love to his son regardless of whether it will be returned. It's the father who extends his current wealth, the robe and the ring and the feast and the sandals and all of that to his son regardless of any past, present, or future actions on the part of his son. It's the father who says to his scorekeeper older son, everything I have is yours. In yet another crazy exuberant gesture of love. It's the father who encourages that son. Like my, fa my parents encouraged me to prioritize relationship over being right. The father knows that spreadsheets are for losers and for those who are truly poor. The father knows that prodigal, extravagant, exuberant giving and expression are for those truly wealthy with the only abundance that really ultimately matters, the abundance of heart and the abundance of spirit. As I see it, the father can take the risk of lavishing this exuberant grace on his younger son because he, the father, lives in a reality that says there's more where that came from. The father does not live in a world of scarcity and of finite resources. He lives in a world of plenitude and abundance and infinity. He's so abundant within himself within his own heart, within his own being, within his own wholeness, within his own completion and strength, that even were the younger son to squander it all over again and to leave again, if the father saw that son returning back again on the horizon, we would see the same story played out all over again. He would run and receive him and welcome him back. Generosity, love, without limit. Some of you know that my favorite philosopher is Friedrich Nietzsche, and he writes, um, he talks about masters or master types, master personalities, and he outlines their traits and characteristics in his work, and he names Jesus as one of the true masters in world history. And Nietzsche says that masters are incredibly strong within themselves. They have a very strong sense of self, very powerful in heart, and in mind. They're very affirming of themselves to the point of sometimes seeming arrogant to outsiders. They're very assertive, they're very assertive, they're very bold, and they're very generous in many ways, uh, almost to a fault, it seems, to others. Specifically, they're not easily offended or diminished by the actions of others, even those that they love that they take the risk of loving. And the reason that this is the case is that master, masterful people, in Nietzsche's view, exist with such an inner abundance that seems to come from an infinite source, they don't even notice when people do or say offensive things to them. They don't feel the loss when people take advantage of their wealth. They're too healthy and robust to even notice. It's almost like a special form of forgetfulness. <laughs> Nietzsche compares them to a great bull or an ox, you know, out in the field, just out there enjoying the sun and swishing its tail and eating the sweet grass. And if you look closely, sure, you see there's flies and gnats and things swarming all around them, and some of them are biting them, biting them and taking some lifeblood out, but he doesn't even notice. No more than to occasionally swat his tail, maybe, but he doesn't even notice it. He's simply too big to feel it. He's too robust. 
It doesn't even register. So what if they take a little blood, even more than their share? There's more where that came from. It's okay, have some more. This is the prodigal father of the story. He can afford to be vulnerable, to risk it all on his young son and to love and give without knowing if it'll be returned. This is the prodigal Jesus hanging on that cross, calling out to his God, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine what type of mastery and internal strength that required to be able to say that? This is the prodigal Socrates telling his students to not hate their city, Athens, for sentencing him to death. Because as he puts it, no individual in no city can ever truly harm a good and wise person. So he drinks the hemlock, he tells a joke, and he dies. No resentment, no accounting, no scorekeeping. This is the prodigal Nelson Mandela. After years, decades of imprisonment, insisting on love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. No accounting, no scorekeeping. This is the prodigal Dr. King. In requiring soul training for people who come and join the civil rights activism that he was a part of and forbidding any kind of lashing out at others who lashed out against them. No scorekeeping, no tit for tat, no eye for an eye, none of that. Just love, grace, compassion, and determination. If there is a thread in Jesus' teaching throughout all the Gospels, especially in his dealing with traditional religion of his day, I think it's this, that he is done, done with the account keeping and virtue scoring of traditional religion and that his God is a God who's done with it too. It has no place in the life of spirit. It has no place among the people of God. The people of God are a people of grace and of the power and fullness that comes from that grace. And it is a grace of a variety that cannot be earned or not earned, deserved or not deserved. It is a grace that is freely extended to all of us, to all living beings. And it is a grace that we, like this father in the story, can then freely extend, lavishly extend to others if we've learned to receive it ourselves. That is Jesus' teaching. That is the heart of his teaching. So this morning, if you hear this story, if you're the lost son, who's wasted what you had, and you're hungry, and you're desperate, just come back. Just come back. We're waiting on you. God is waiting on you. Arms are waiting to embrace you. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. You don't even have to promise that you'll try to earn it. Just forget all that. Just throw all that away and just come back. Here this morning at Unity, there are ministers and prayer partners and others that are here that can help you take that first step to come back for whatever it is you've been lost in. Just come back. Come as you are. No pressure. We're ready to receive you. Now, if you're the older son, keeping score on yourself and everyone else in your life, resentful at the imbalances that you see when people get more or less than they deserve. For your own sake, you gotta renounce that. You gotta give that up. You gotta find a way to begin to loosen your grip on that scorecard. Just do what you can. You may not be able to do it all at once. You may have to do some work and do all kinds of things, but just begin the process, if you can, to loosen your grip on that scorecard and just turn it over. Turn it over to something or somebody bigger or greater than you. Call it what you will. God, karma, the universe, fate, 
I don't care, whatever. Just turn it over. Let go of it and free yourself from it. Shake it off. You've got to try to give it up in some way. It is a trap, and it'll keep you small and bitter and resentful for the rest of your life. It's exhausting. And the sooner you can do it, the better. Because as soon as you do it, new possibilities for connection, for life, for relationship, for affinity with the people we say we love, that becomes possible. And none of us have the time we think we have left with the people that we love. Don't waste it running a spreadsheet. Move in the direction of prodigality, being prodigal like that father, ready to love, ready to forgive, ready to bestow blessings, ready to do all those things from a posture of empowerment, from a posture of your own inner abundance, which your own practice helps you to create. It's an infinite well. Masterful people know that they have drunk from an infinite fountain that all of us have within ourselves. They've drunk from it and they know that there's more where that came from. They don't have to keep track. There's more than enough for everyone, many times over. It's a well that never runs dry. This is the life eternal. And it is the divine life. It is everlasting and it is full of glory. Amen? Amen. Amen.